the interrogation setting. And the other piece is involves the pressure of interrogation and, and how it can wear down a suspect's motivation and ability to, uh, to resist pressure uh, and to, to uh, wear down the suspect's ability to continue to maintain his or her in, uh, innocence. Um, and um, is that one of our participants barking? Uh, um, uh, and ultimately when our resistance gets worn down, we become more susceptible to social influence, our cognitive capacity uh, 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 declines. Uh, we talked about uh, personal risk factors uh, for false confessions, so characteristics of the suspects themselves. And I'll roll through these pretty quickly. Um, uh, there are various states that can put people at risk uh, for false confession, and those include sleep, sleep deprivation, intoxication, drug and drug withdrawal. Uh, they, the, the common denominator is, again, they, they, they wear down our cognitive capacities and render us more susceptible to social influence. They uh, reduce our, our ability to, to uh, regulate our, uh, our uh, thoughts, emotions, and behavior. Uh, and then innocence itself uh, turns out to be a, an interesting uh, risk factor because innocent people uh, we find behave uh, differently in some ways than, uh, uh, than guilty suspects. Um, innocent people uh, tend to want to talk. They're, they're more likely to uh, waive their uh, rights to silence, more likely to waive their right uh, to counsel. They have uh, this view that, uh, that their innocence will set them free, that if, if I just explain myself, uh, that uh, my innocence will become uh, known. And even in the course of interrogation, when innocent people realize that they're not going to be able to convince an investigator of their innocence, sometimes they, they confess to end the interrogation with the idea of, well, the prosecutor will understand, the judge will uh, understand. Eventually, this will all uh, sort itself out. So innocence, the state of innocence can pr serve as a, a risk factor. Um, I think we um, rolled through that. Uh, we talked about uh, youth, um, people with developmental disabilities, and people with mental illness as particularly at risk uh, for uh, false confession. And of course, there's some unique features of being young, being uh, developmental developmentally delayed and being mentally ill, but some of the common features are, are also diminished capacity and ability to uh, understand long-term or, or to appreciate long-term consequences, impulsivity, uh, and, and so on. So um, as far as traits go, youth, people with mental illness, people with developmental disabilities are particularly at risk for false confession, and they are uh, disproportionately represented in false confession and wrongful conviction cases. Uh, we also talked about situational factors for false confession. Uh, and this is basically the high pressure of the guilt presumptive interrogation. Uh, I gave a brief overview of, of the read technique, which is, is the most commonly trained method of interrogation. Um, that uh, uh, it's, it's been in development for more than 50 years. And I use the phrase guilt presumptive interrogation because it's, uh, it's, it's actually a part of the training that for the exercise of interrogation, the suspect is presumed to be guilty. It often starts out with, uh, with a statement such as, um, we're not here to determine whether you're innocent or guilty. We know you're guilty. We're just trying to figure out why you did it or who else was involved or, or what other information. And the, the general idea behind it with the, with, uh, is that the tactics encompassed in the read technique are geared toward, are geared toward getting the suspect past the point of confession and to provide the interrogator uh, with information about the crime uh, that, um, 
that would speak to the culpability of the suspect. Uh, so high pressure interrogation, whether it's specifically a read based interrogation or uh, based on some other uh, training or method um, uh, is also a risk factor for false confession. And within this framework, certain types of tactics are particularly um, uh, increase the risk of false confession. And those tactics include the use of, of false evidence poise and the use of minimization tactics. Uh, and I, uh, let's see. Minimization tactics are uh, those in which the, the investigator uh, in, in various ways uh, minimizes uh, the crime. It, it, it could be suggesting that the crime is not a big, not a big deal as it, it seems, uh, or that um, uh, other uh, offering rationales and excuses, other people in this situation would have done the same thing or the victim deserves it. Uh, uh, so these sorts of minimizations uh, also increase the, the risk of false confession by implicitly conveying to the suspect that a confession will be met with um, uh, more lenient treatment, if not explicitly, implicitly conveying that information. So we talked about uh, confession contam uh, contamination. Uh, why it is that false confessions are convincing. Uh, the an analyses of known cases of wrongful conviction and wrong uh, false confession show that uh, co the confessions, they appeared compelling. They, they, they contained uh, details of the crime that uh, only the guilty person should know or we would think would know. Sometimes they include um, references to the victim's behavior, uh, the victim's appearance, victim's mental state. They also include things like uh, uh, apologies and expressions of remorse. Sometimes the suspect brings them up on their own and sometimes the investigator actually asks for them in the course of interrogation. So huh, that's what we went through uh, and and the, the, the hour, that's a very condensed version. Let me take a breath and, and see if there are any questions so far about anything that, that I covered in the, the first hour. And again, feel free to either unmute yourself and just ask directly, put it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll come around. Hey Brian, I think we're good. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, so we're, we're now at the session, section of assessing coercion and in interrogation. So in, in this section, we're, we're starting with the assumption that, uh, that there is a recording uh, of the interrogation, videotape or audio tape. It's always better if we have a videotape interrogation. And I, I recognize that, uh, that although uh, videotaped interrogations are a, a relatively new uh, 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 phenomenon that for, for many, many years interrogations were not um, uh, recorded. Uh, and it, it's, it's much more difficult. Uh, I, I do get involved in cases, particularly post-conviction cases, where there is no recording of the interrogation and we're left trying to piece it together with uh, testimony from the investigators, notes from the investigators, um, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, testimony or, or statements by the suspect, but it's, it's far more difficult to, you know, to establish what actually uh, went on in those interrogations. So really now I'm, I'm focusing on, on recorded interrogations. So I'm, I'm gonna start out by asking uh, Marissa to say a few words about what lawyers actually look for when uh, making sense of, of videotaped interrogations, because I'm not a lawyer um, and uh, you folks have more experience in this realm. So please, some thoughts. Well, actually, I, it's interesting because I can't talk really about recorded interrogations because I'm in a jurisdiction that does not record overwhelmingly. 
Um, but you know, from a post-conviction perspective of looking at cases where there's a confession, at least in my experience, um, these are, I think, probably the hardest cases to evaluate because you'll look at the confession and you read what, either you read it on paper or you read what the detective said about it, and it sounds incredibly compelling because there would be evidence that you know, only the guilty person should know and it, there's great detail about it. And I, I found it very, very difficult to kind of read a confession or read testimony about a confession and not think, oh, of course he did it. There's no question. So I think part of the trick about evaluating cases in post-conviction where there's a confession or alleged confession is to kind of put that confession on the shelf. You know, it's almost in a little box off to the side and try to do an independent analysis of the evidence notwithstanding the conf confession. You know, was there other, uh, was there any physical evidence? Were there other witnesses? Were there eyewitnesses? Was, was there any kind of um, evidence that pointed to this individual independent of the confession? The second step, I think, in evaluating cases of alleged false confession is to you know, look at the defendant themselves. Is there anything about this particular individual that might put them in one of the suspect categories that Dr. Cutler talked about before? How old were they? Were they young? Were they elderly? Were they under the influence? Were they suffering from an addiction? Were they suffering from some kind of um, mental illness? Was there anything about that particular individual that could make them more susceptible? So I, I'll talk about a case that I handled for my client, really easy, where the only evidence used against him was his own confession. And it never made sense to me why he would you know, sign a confession, because to be perfectly frank, well, he's a big guy. He's probably about six foot seven, six foot eight, and, and you know, can clearly take care of himself. So I, it always, you know, my impression had always been that if it came down to it in an interrogation room and if they were you know, physically beating him or threatening him, he wouldn't respond or it wouldn't really make that much of an impact given his, his ability to take care of himself. When I did an analysis of him with Jim Trainum, who's a retired detective out of DC, um, who does a lot of cold case investigations and many people here may know him, um, as well as with the forensic psychologist, it became clear of two things. One, Willie is the kind of guy who would go along with anybody. That you know, he was the younger brother. Anytime his older brother said, hey, Willie, let's jump the turnstile, let's go down and see the Phillies play, he'd be the first one to do it. So he, he had this kind of just, I want to go along to get along. And the second thing was that he was very susceptible to authority. That anytime authority kind of reared in front of him, he would go along with it, notwithstanding any other um, kind of his physical appearance or anything else about him. So it took getting to kind of know him and know a little bit about him that had it all kind of the pieces fall into place. So obviously that may not be available to the prosecutors on the call, but certainly for those innocence organizations that are doing these evaluations, you can do that. Um, and also I will say that in Willie's case in particular, uh, the prosecutors, uh, when we were toward the end of this, prosecutors brought in Steve Kleiman and Chris Meisner, who are two um, internationally known experts on false confessions to interview Willie. They did a cognitive interview with Willie, which we've talked about with Steve before on these webinars. And they were also able to come to the same conclusion. So with cooperation from counsel, um, that certainly is a possibility to be able to do an in-depth interview with the defendant um, from both the prosecutor and the innocence organization's perspective. So knowing the individual and, and what kind of capacity they have is important. And the third thing that I would say is with any confession case, it's helpful to do a kind of a chart of you know, comparing the statements that are within the confession to the known evidence who knew that at the time the defendant went into that interrogation room? Was that known to police? Was it not known to police? Was it known to defendant? Was it not known to defendant? And a lot of that information you can get just by reading the transcript and kind of piecing things together. So I think kind of taking a very broad perspective, taking the, the interrogation kind of out of the equation initially, uh, looking at the defendant and what his own, where he is in his own kind of capacities and, and risk factors, and then putting the confession back in and trying to chart uh, where the information could have come from if not from the defendant, where there are other sources, I found very, very helpful in trying to analyze these cases. If anybody else has things they want to kind of add from an attorney's perspective, you know, by all means, please feel free to put that in here. Hey, Brian, I think you're good to go. Okay, moving on to uh, experts. Uh, 
it's it's a little difficult to talk about um, experts and the generally false confession experts is the name that uh, we go by as a group because we're 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 somewhat diverse. So I want to talk about sort of different different uh, types of of experts. Uh, I'm a social psychologist by training. Uh, social psychology is is the psychology of how uh, uh, normal people think behave and feel in social situations. It covers things like the psychology of attitudes and persuasion, uh, interpersonal relationships, group processes. It's a historic field in social psychology, uh, but uh, it also includes social cognition, information processing. So uh, that, that's, the, pers that's the, the largest lens that I, I look at uh, in a case a psychologist who's, a, uh, and, and as, as a social psychologist, I'm not trained in clinical psychology. I don't do psychological assessments. We also have developmental psychologists who are, uh, developmental psychologists is uh, basically the psychology of what you can do at one age that you can't do at another age. And that goes from uh, uh, birth uh, through, through the lifespan. Uh, I know of at least one, um, a physiological psychologist who, whose expertise is in the area of, of polygraph research, who's uh, involved in um, uh, interrogation and confession cases, and he has yet a different perspective. Uh, there are some who are involved, who are trained more in sociology, um, and I, I feel even less confident about uh, speaking about their perspectives. And, and Jim Trainum is is a former. Uh, uh, Washington DC detective, as, as Marissa mentioned, so has, has a different training and, and skill set. But we all tend to come at the same literature or, or similar literature. Some may rely more on certain types of studies than, than other studies, but we're, we're all basically in the same ballpark. So we have different perspectives, but what's actually less known is what we actually do in evaluating interrogations. You know, there's been uh, a, a call for uh, uh, a number of years that we need to start recording these interrogations and making the uh, interrogations transparent so that fact finders uh, can, uh, and lawyers can evaluate what went on, but not a whole lot of talk of what to do with the, the videotapes when you get them. And uh, I, I strongly suspect that if uh, if a defense lawyer or, or a prosecuting attorney contacted three or four different uh, experts and had them evaluate the same case, they'd get a lot of similarities, but some differences in, in the results also. But generally speaking, what we're doing is we're reviewing uh, the uh, discovery around the case, the indictment, police reports, uh, the recorded interrogation, if there is one, um, aspects of the file that would speak to personal risk factors like education level uh, of the defendant, uh, um, health records that might speak to mental illness, and of course, the age uh, of the defendant to get at the question of personal risk factors, viewing the interrogation to understand what actually transpired was this a 30 minute interrogation or a four hour or an eight hour interrogation? Uh, what were, uh, we, we would go through the set of, of risk factors. Was the suspect isolated uh, from outside contact? What was the orientation, the interrogation orientation uh, of the investigator? What were the tactics that were used in the interrogation? We would also, uh, uh, try to understand um, contamination as it occurred by analyzing who said what, when. Were facts originally introduced by the suspect or were they originally introduced by the interrogator? With, with a videotape, you can, you can tell how to do this. So that's the kind of analysis uh, that experts generally do, though, again, I think you, you would get uh, uh, unique perspectives and unique differences as a function of whether you ask me or Saul Casson or Richard Leo or one of the other 
uh, false confession uh, experts. But there's, there's, I'm guessing, a good deal of variability in our opinions and uh, how we uh, express our, our opinions, both in writing and, and orally. Uh, so that's, that's in, in a very broad overview of what experts do. Um, yeah, I and, I, yes, I, please. I can just say that that's not, I, I don't want people to think that that's just something for the defense lawyers or for the innocence organizations. Like you're working with an expert, particularly in false confession cases, um, can be in, extremely important and, and reveal a great deal of information for prosecutors as well. Um, and again, but just going back to the BC case, as I mentioned, the experts in that case were hired by the Commonwealth to be able to do an evaluation. And then it turns out not just at Mr. Vizi, but at several others. So um, that's something that prosecutors can absolutely lean on and use that if you have if you need recommendations, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to kind of talk to you in terms of what kind of expert exactly what Dr. Cutler was saying. There are different, uh, both sides, different kind of focuses for each one um, that we can kind of help find the right one for you. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to also just take a second and go back to a point that I raised earlier because I, I, I think it's important that, and that's this, there's usually two questions that we're addressing in our evaluations. One, evaluations. One is the degree of, of coercion uh, in the interrogation. And the other is the question of contamination. Uh, coercion, uh, uh, addresses the question of was the was the suspect likely coerced into giving uh, a confession? But just because confession uh, coercion is present doesn't mean the confession is false. You can coerce a true confession, and you can co coerce a false confession. If you're uncomfortable with the word coerce, we could talk about persuade, because that's really what interrogators are trying to do. They're trying to persuade suspects. Um, uh, to confess. You can persuade a true confession and you can persuade a false confession. So just because there's coercion, it doesn't mean that doesn't render a confession false. The, uh, we'll get into later uh, 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 more on how to evaluate confessions and how to get, you know, what are the, the indicators of true versus false confession. Coercion can increase the risk of false confession, but it is not per se an indicator of false confession. So we're looking in our evaluations, we're looking separately at true versus false uh, confessions. So um, I think I've covered that. I wanna talk about what we've been doing with, uh, in uh, our company, Coral Coast Group, because I, I I think it's innovative and it's, it's changed the way that, uh, uh, that we uh, evaluate interrogations and confessions and it's been, been met with uh, pretty high levels of satisfactions in, in, satisfaction in the cases that uh, we've used it. Basically, I created the interrogation evaluation clinic kind of modeled after law school Clinics that are, uh, you know, that that are integrally involved in, in the, the practical training of lawyers. Uh, I, I think of uh, our work as as training the next generation of uh, consultants and expert witnesses in this area. So right now, our our clinic is staffed by myself, Jeff Kaplan, who's on the call and who uh, you're going to hear from in a moment. Jeff is a, a doctoral student uh, in our forensic psychology program. Uh, his, his master's thesis and, do, and dissertation research is in this area, and he's very far along uh, in the program. Uh, he is the director of our evaluation clinic. Uh, and we have four other trained doctoral students and, and one undergraduate student trained to evaluate interrogations using a specific method. And by interrogations, I mean recorded interrogations. Uh, so the evaluation involves uh, breaking down the interrogation process, including uh, specific counts of all the persuasive tactics that were used in the interrogation, descriptions of the tactics, and, and quotations, usually as uh, samples 
of, of what was done, though we can provide comprehensive lists as well, given the way that interrogations are coded. We also delve further into the file when possible to look at personal and situational factors, risk factors, such as youth, uh, uh, mental illness, developmental disabilities, uh, fatigue, uh, uh, and, and those sorts of factors. We also analyze confession contamination. Um, we, we specifically analyze who said what and when to get at the question of, of whether any uh, uh, unique facts uh, or, or observations raised by the suspect during the interrogation were first raised by the suspect or were suggested uh, by the interrogators. And then uh, we, we typically debrief uh, with uh, the lawyers who, who retained us to do the evaluation um, by uh, sometimes we send them uh, email of the evaluation, sometimes we screen share and, and, and walk through it. There's no various ways of doing that. We use uh, an instrument called the interview and interrogation uh, assessment instrument. Uh, several years ago, uh, 2016, uh, colleagues and I received uh, a grant from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, that's Canada's version of the National Science Foundation, to develop this instrument. Uh, there is no such no other instrument that's uh, geared toward evaluating uh, videotape, uh, evaluating coercion and videotaped interrogation. So this is the first. Uh, we, and, and by we, I mean largely Jeff <laughs> has been working on this uh, for what, four years uh, or so? Uh, um, yeah, about four years. Yeah, and uh, we've used uh, well-accepted psychometric methods uh, and, and psychology to, to develop items. Uh, we've relied on previous studies that have assessed interrogations. Uh, we have trained certified coders using uh, third party software. And you're gonna see a demo of how this works. And the idea is that the, uh, the instrument should facilitate some objectivity and consistency in how interrogation uh, reviews uh, reviews are done and uh, also uh, contains uh, an important component of confession contamination. So um, that's an overview. I wanted to invite uh, Jeff to, to walk us through uh, how the evaluation system works. Do I need to stop screen sharing? Yeah, um, it's uh, it's not letting me share my screen. Okay. To be able to. Uh, now there that. we go. Sorry. Okay. Is it? Uh, can you see it? We have your desktop up. There it is. Now, now we can see the in an interrogation video and then some charts. Okay. Well, I'm actually showing you a video of the instrument because uh, the software often doesn't really uh, show up very well over screen share. Um, but this is what uh, what it looks like while I'm coding an interrogation. We, we have a separate component uh, for keeping track of things uh, like personal risk factors because as you'd imagine, I really don't have to code that in real time. Um, a suspect's not going to develop uh, an intellectual disability over the course of the interrogation, for example. Um, so I have a list of tactics on the lower left-hand side there that I can code. Uh, these were chosen um, because many of them are risk factors for false confession. We've, uh, we've also validated them as, uh, as having coercive properties. So to use the instrument, I just start the video and as the investigator uh, begins to use the tactic, I will record that. When they finished, I would stop the video. Now I have uh, the option of making notes on any tactics that come up. So for instance, uh, in, in this demo, I recorded that a piece of, info or piece of evidence was presented and then um, made note of exactly what that evidence was uh, 
having this marked down right on the timeline helps us a lot in keeping track of uh, who raised what information first, which um, is important for our, our later uh, contamination analysis. And I can take a lot of other notes there. Um, I didn't take a lot here because this is just a demo, but I often write down quotes uh, and keep track of what sort of uh, excuses and justifications the uh, the investigator came up with. Now I'm just uh, going to switch my shared screen here to one of our reports. Okay, so after um, I finish coding the video and I export the data, uh, these we type it up into uh, to a report. Um, and you might have noticed the color coding during uh, during the, the demonstration just a moment ago. We keep track of not just what tactics were used, but also divide them, uh, divide them up by type, which helps us also get at exactly what sort of persuasive or coercive pressure was leveraged against the suspect. Um, so the rapport building tactics are usually pretty benign, uh, with the exception of posing as the suspect's advocate, who's there to help them out. Um, that could be construed as coercive, uh, essentially because the investigator is making a promise to um, help them out if they're cooperative. Evidence-based tactics are uh, those that leverage something investigation-based. Um, and these really vary. Um, for instance, presenting a legitimate piece of evidence isn't considered as coercive as um, bluffing about evidence or uh, bluffing about the strength of their case or anything like that. So the confrontational and emotional uh, manipulation tactics both create punishments for um, for denials and emphasize uh, the punishments that uh, that the suspect will be facing but um, sort of in different ways so emotional provocation would be um, insinuating or saying something like the suspect will be disowned by their family and their community if they don't begin to show remorse and uh, you know, make a confession that uh, expresses how sorry they are. Confrontational attacks um, generally leverage the charges and sentencing that they uh, might be facing, but um, also uh, contain some more uh, immediate punishments such as calling the suspect a liar and making aggressive accusations whenever, uh, whenever they try and make denials. So finally, um, minimization tactics hold out the hope that uh, confessing will have some benefit to the suspect or at least minimize the uh, consequences that, uh, that they'll face. I didn't lay them out in this order uh, by chance. This is generally the chronological order that most interrogations follow. Uh, so first, introduce, establish poor, use evidence-based tactics to convince the suspect that they're caught and that they're going to be convicted pretty much no matter what. Uh, after that, you talk about the very harsh consequences that they'll be facing. And then finally, minimization tactics are used to hold out confessing as some way that they can uh, mitigate the punishments that, that they're eventually going to be facing. So just below that, um, I provide a, a total count of all tactics as well as a, a summary of the interrogation, uh, usually in one to three paragraphs. Here, um, we'd also highlight highlight any uh, risk factors for false confession should they be present. And below, um, we lay out exactly what tactics were coded, uh, as well as um, include a few quotes uh, to illustrate exactly what we're talking about, just um, in case there's any confusion about what the labels mean. Here I took down quite a few. We also offer measures um, of what the suspect was doing, uh, such as 
their general demeanor and level of duress, uh, denials and objections that they made if uh, at any point they requested an attorney. And of course, um, any admissions, uh, confessions, or any um, any inculpatory statements that uh, that they made during the interrogation. And finally, uh, we have our confession contamination analysis. Uh, this one is rather lacking because there's really no new information that um, came out of this particular interrogation. The suspect ended up making admissions, but not a confession per se where she really went through the actions that she took so because of that there's really nothing that could be analyzed um, to gauge the reliability of the confession that's considered rather uh, a weak uh, confession or admission um, sometimes we see very detailed confessions but uh, essentially, the suspect is just repeating back exactly what the investigator told them to say with all the information and evidence that uh, that the investigator gave them during the interrogation. Whereas, of course, if a suspect were to um, produce that narrative and all of that information independently on their own, uh, it um, could uh, go towards demonstrating that the confession is reliable. But I think uh, Dr. Cutler was going to... Um, be getting into uh, this a little bit further, um, but just pause here and uh, see if there are any questions regarding uh, regarding these evaluations. Nope, I, I think you're good, Jeff. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll uh, see the uh, screen share back to you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. So while that's going though, Jeff, I did have a, a just a quick question is um, the, most of these evaluations are done, it seems, in terms of looking at a case where somebody's already been convicted of the crime. Are you using this tool as an evaluative um, before a case goes to trial or helping lawyers in situations where it's even before a case goes to trial? Because I'm thinking this might be a very helpful tool for prosecutors who are looking to try a case might want to look at just to be able to judge the confession from an analytical perspective. Yeah, generally, um, it's before uh, there's been a confession or a, a case has gone to trial. Um, sometimes they have been used um, in suppression hearings and also used uh, actually at trial. Um, it's not really the um, end all and be all of, of what we do, but it, it is uh, an empirically, um, sort of empirically uh, guided uh, assessment framework for organizing, uh, organizing our findings. Um, you know, it, it really can't replace a full affidavit and it definitely can't replace testimony, uh, but it often becomes part of more formal reports and reference during testimony. Um, it can also kind of be used by defense attorneys to gauge um, whether they'd really have a challenge uh, or reason to challenge the, the confession. So if we come back and say, there's really nothing here, this confession looks solid, then you know, these um, reports are pretty quick and relatively cheap for us to turn out. And it could save, uh, save the defense a lot of time and money pursuing something that might not... Um, be worthwhile where the other hand uh, sometimes we come back and say wow that was like egregious <laughs> and uh, we have the numbers here to show it I, I would add that uh, we, we've used uh, the instrument in uh, probably somewhere around 15 15 cases give or take uh, and uh, I, they've all been uh, not yet tried cases. Uh, I do get involved and in we uh, as uh, our group gets involved in post conviction review cases, but those cases tend to be older and, uh, and, and usually there's no videotaped interrogation. For this specific analysis, uh, we would need uh, a, a recorded interrogation at the very least audio, preferably video. But the analysis would, uh, the, the approach would be the same whether we were 
uh, asked to do it by a prosecuting attorney or, or a defense attorney. Shall we continue? Looks good from here. No questions uh, being posed, so please do. Okay. Get myself set up again here. Okay, we're back in share mode. You're able to see my PowerPoint? Yes, all looks good, thank you. Okay, good. So uh, uh, we're on to the last section, uh, evaluating, um, I'm sorry, uh, evaluating, why can't I get back to my screen here? There we go. Um, evaluating confession reliability. So the general idea here is that, um, uh, I, again, it's one thing to evaluate coercion. It's another thing to evaluate the reliability of the confession, whether the confession is true or false. You can coerce true confessions. You can uh, uh, produce, uh, you can coerce false confessions. Both social scientists and uh, uh, trainers of interrogators agree on uh, for the most part, on uh, on how to tell whether a confession is true or false, uh, and uh, that involves uh, eliciting detail in the course of, of the interrogation and confession uh, that only a guilty person would know, and it could be information that the police already have and have not leaked uh, in the course of interrogation, or it could be new information that that the police can uh, then go out and corroborate. So we're looking specifically, it, it's not enough to get a confession or an admission. It's, it's, it's not enough to get somebody to say, yeah, I did it. Uh, uh, we're, we're looking for more than that. We're looking for information uh, that, that would speak to the, the suspect's culpability, guilty knowledge, and then that information has to be corroborated in some way. Uh, so even the trainers would say, if all you have is an admission, then you need to be concerned that you, you may have a false admission or a false confession. And this is why the contamination analysis is so important because uh, uh, suspects can produce detailed narratives and writing uh, and, and recording that gives the appearance that they knew exactly what happened in the crime and may include apologies and expressions of remorse. But if that information was, uh, if, that, if, if the investigators contaminated the confession by basically educating the suspect on those details, then it really messes up your reliability analysis. You have to be able to isolate information that uh, that only the suspect knew that the suspect produced first and wasn't leaked by the um, interrogator. That's really the, the crux of it. I want to go through some related points on this, beginning with uh, false indicators of, um, uh, of, of uh, the truthfulness of confession. Uh, one is verbal and nonverbal cues to deception. Uh, some people think that they are very good at telling whether people are lying. Uh, decades of social psychological research suggests we can't do this. There have been tons and tons of studies on lay people and professionals' ability to detect deception, and we just suck at it. That, that's the bottom line. Police, uh, uh, police officers are, are uh, really no better than lay people at this. Uh, uh, we tend to be around uh, 54, 55 percent accurate on average, where chance is 50 percent. 
police tend to be more confident, but not more accurate. So uh, if uh, you think you can watch a suspect confessing and tell whether the suspect uh, is, is telling the truth uh, or lying, you're fooling yourself. And yes, the same actually applies to testimony, but that, that's in a conversation for another day. Uh, police reports of interrogations and, uh, and confessions where there are no recordings were often forced to rely on re police reports uh, of what happened in the interrogation. And I'm going to assume for this conversation that, that, that the police are on the up and up and trying to do a good job and trying to accurately uh, record in their notes what happened in the interrogation. There are about a half a dozen studies of police note taking uh, in, uh, in interviews with, with witnesses. Uh, and what, th there's a, a, a reliable set of findings that, um, uh, that generally what the police report is accurate. They're pretty accurate, not 100% accurate, but fairly accurate in, in the details they report. Uh, what's uh, missing is a lot of detail. There are a lot of errors of omission uh, in their reports. Now, some of these errors of omission are probably reasonable. Um, they don't have to record all the small talk that goes on, uh, but uh, there are important errors of omission also. And the other thing that uh, characterizes police reports, again, even when they're trying to do a good job, is they tend to focus their, um, their notes on what the suspect said and not the questions asked or the tactics used uh, by the investigators. And that, that's a natural process uh, uh, with uh, uh, taking notes about interviews. Interviewers in general tend to take notes of the responses and not the questions that are asked. As, as you can see in our analysis, we're focusing on uh, both the, uh, the questions asked, the tactics used by the interrogators, and the suspect's uh, responses. And because of what I explained earlier about contamination, confession detail and compellingness without corroboration is not a good ind indicator uh, of, of the accuracy of confessions because of the contamination problem. But where you can uh, demonstrate uh, that uh, the, the suspect did produce non-contaminated details that were corroborated, those are very good indices of the reliability of, of confessions. Um, in, in your own work, uh, we, we would encourage you to uh, evaluate the personal and situational risk factors. Uh, you, you may not be relying on the same kind of system that we have, but you can make your own um, uh, uh, tools for basic coding some of the basic person out, personal and social uh, situational risk factors to at least give you an idea about the level of uh, uh, susceptibility to false confession of the suspect and also the pressures put on uh, by, by the interrogators, knowing that these two factors interact with each other. Uh, and conduct a contamination analysis. Uh, so that requires really carefully analyzing who said what and when. Uh, were details, uh, uh, and, and well, before the instrument, what I, the way I started was creating a, a, a separate list of all the details provided by the interrogator and the suspect and, and noting the timelines of these, who said what and when. Uh, and see if you can isolate um, lists of details that, uh, that the suspect produced and uh, that uh, were not first su suggested uh, by the interrogator uh, and, and then discounting any details that the interrogator first suggested. And ultimately where you get details uh, from a suspect, uh, crime related uh, details, uh, compare those details with the evidence in the case. Uh, again, both the social scientists and the trainers agree that corroboration 
of those details is a critical component to analyzing the truth of a confession. So ultimately, uh, the, the criteria for confession reliability is you're looking for inculpatory facts that were independently offered by the suspect, the suspect, demonstrably not learned by the suspect, not contaminated, not easily guessed or imagined and are corroborated uh, by the evidence. And I'm ending with this uh, uh, quote uh, from the, uh, the folks from the Reed Institute, the absence of any specific corroboration within the confession should be viewed suspiciously. A confession that merely acknowledges involvement in a crime but contains no additional details should be viewed suspiciously. And I think that's all I have. Terrific. Thank you so much, um, Brian. We have a few minutes left for folks to be able to ask questions or kind of push back if you want, um, whether it's on the uh, what, what Dr. Kaplan shared in terms of the evaluation tool itself or looking at false confessions generally. Happy to kind of hear what folks have to say. Again, you can unmute yourself, put it in the chat, or just raise your hand and I'll be able to call on you that way. One thing I am curious about from folks who are attending is if people have cases you're evaluating right now that have a false confession in them. Um, if you could, if you have one and you would just kind of raise your hand or unmute, let us know. It, it, it's, I'm just curious to know whether this is impactful for somebody right now. Thank you. Um, where, if you could just address the issue of looking at cases without a videotape, like, and, and particularly from the prosecutor's perspective, where they don't have access to the defendant to be able to do an analysis with him or her to look for those kind of situational risk factors that you might do through an independent interview. What are some of the things the prosecutors can do to try to use some of these tactics you talked about today on a cold record review without a tape? Sure. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, I, I get involved in these cases pretty regularly. Um, uh, uh, a lot of them are post-conviction review, and we look at the pers uh, personal risk factors of, uh, of the suspect, at, uh, of the defendant at the time. Was this person a youth? Uh, what, what records do we have of, of mental illness, developmental disability? Uh, there are likely some aspects of the interrogation that are, are not, not a dispute. Uh, and that can include uh, what was the suspect isolated in the interrogation room? Probably isolation is, is a, a factor that adds stress. What was the length of the interrogation? We know that interrogation duration is also a risk factor for false confessions. Uh, a survey of, of police officers show that average interrogations um, like 500 police officer respondents, average interrogations were about an hour and a half. We see a lot in the you know one to four hour range, but if 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 your interrogation uh, was you know six, eight, ten, twelve hours, that's a flag. Um, why did it go on so long? Even the interrogators you know raise questions about why why should it go on uh, so long. Uh, 
so interrogation time is a risk factor. Uh, there, there may be uh, uh, testimony uh, in, in, you know, in a hearing, in a case about some of, some of the uh, uh, conditions under which uh, the, the defendant was interrogated. There may be um, testimony by, by the police. There may be contested testimony. Um, that's just kind of hard to deal with. Uh, 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 in, in, in my work, all I can say is, uh, if this happened, here's the likely effect uh, that it would have. So, so uh, usually the personal risk factors you can get some kind of handle on. Um, the situational risk factors, some of them are, are documented and not contested. Others are, are just uh, more um, speculative and those are the cards that were dealt. Uh, Marissa, you're on, on mute again, I think. Anybody else want to chime in with other experiences or cases they've had or other questions for either Dr. Kaplan or Dr. Cullen? Okay, well, I want to, um, again, thank you so much, Dr. Cutler, Dr. Calton, for your time um, and for sharing all this information with folks. We will, we did record this, um, belatedly started it, so with apologies, but um, we will have the recording available and Dr. Cutler's uh, PowerPoint will be available as well um, uh, for folks who will be sending that out too. So uh, thank you again. Thanks everybody for taking the time to be with us, stay safe, and we will, be talking to everyone coming up soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Brian, Jeff, thank you so much. Oh, that was just incredibly helpful, I think, for, for folks to hear. Well, our, our pleasure. It was an honor to address this group. We, we really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's this is very special that where the work that they're doing is really um, pretty cutting edge, and so I, I firmly believe in trying to give them as many tools as possible to be able to make life a little easier. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so I, it, I I promise your PowerPoint is that okay to be able to get your PowerPoint out for them for. I'm I, I'm fine with it. Uh, I, I I generally when I share these I share them as PDFs. Th yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. not no, like, I... yeah because you don't want it to be able to be manipulated. Not that anybody on this call would. But <laughs> it's just, just my, uh, what, what I tend to do. And you're welcome to share it. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you both so much. You're quite welcome. Uh, would it be possible to get a link to the uh, recording? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very well. Yeah. Like I said, I kind of started this one a little bit late, but I have both last week's, uh, last month's rather, and this month's that would um, be great. available. And I'll be happy to get those to you. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Recording thanks. With... Gonna log off. Great. Okay. Great. Thanks, Thank Jeff. And yep. thanks, Brian, so much. Um, Our pleasure. Just so happy to make this connection. Great. Uh, we're, we are as well. And reach out if we can be of more help. 100% will. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Stay Bye. safe and healthy. Bye.